Good morning, fellow Redditors. I saw this question on r slash learn math and thought it'd make for an interesting discussion. The poster has an issue with how the professor has graded the question because they disagree on the solution. So let's take a look at this problem. We'll go over how the uh, alleged professor answered it and then we'll discuss how the poster of the question thought it should be answered. And let me know in the comments what you think, which solution is better. An exam has only three true and false questions. I would word it as true or false, but this is pretty much just taken verbatim from the post. I didn't want to switch up the wording. Three true and false questions. The probability that you know the first question is 17%. The probability that you know the second question is 59%. And the probability that you know the last question is 70%. What's the probability that you get all three true or false questions correct? Well, what do you think? Do you have any issues with this question, the way it's asked? I have a couple issues with the wording of the question, whether or not this is exactly how it appeared on the examination, who knows. But like I already said, calling it true and false is pretty weird. True or false, I think, would be better. And then the wording about the probability. The probability that you know the first question the probability that you know the second question, there's a 100% chance you know the question, right? You're going to read it. It's going to be on the test, right? It's not like you have to figure out the question and the answer. So guarantee you're going to know the question. It should say, um, you know, something like the probability that you know the correct answer to the first question is 17% or something to that effect. The other thing that's not wording based is the issue of independence. So if a student knows the answer to one of the true or false questions, there's a good chance that they're more likely to know the answers to the other true or false questions. Because if they know one, well, that suggests some amount of studying, they're certainly more likely to know the other answers than someone who didn't know the first question, say. Now, the fact that the question doesn't address anything about independence suggests that the reader should just assume that the probabilities of the student answering the questions correctly are all independent. But regardless, with the preliminary whining out of the way, let's get to the meat and potatoes. So first, how did the professor say that this question should be answered? Well, he gave the most obvious solution that you may be thinking. What's the probability that we get all three questions correct? Well, we would have to take the probability that we get the first question correct, which is 17% or 0 0.17, and then multiply that by the probability that we get the second question correct, which is 59%. And then multiply that by the probability that we get the third question correct, which is 70%, which as a decimal is 0.7. If events are independent of each other, which it seems we're supposed to assume they are here, then their probabilities can just be multiplied together to figure out how likely it is that they all occur. We could then just consult our favorite calculator, whatever yours happens to be. Mine is not the BA2+, but I have it on hand. So 0.17 times 0.59 times 0.7, and we get about 0.07, so about a 7% chance. Now, the student who posted this question disagrees with the professor on this solution, and the reason he disagrees comes back to the strange wording, specifically that it talks about knowing as opposed to just answering correctly. It doesn't say there's a 17% chance that we answer the first question correctly. It says there's a 17% chance that we know the answer to the first question. Hence, from the perspective of the student, these probabilities are not accounting for all the ways that he might answer a question correctly. Sure, there's a 17% chance that you know the answer, but suppose you don't know the questions were said to be true or false. So if you don't know the answer, there's still a chance you could get the question correct. We could use a little picture to sketch out the way that the student is perceiving this problem. For any question, we could represent the possible responses of the student in this box. Let's say the area of the box is one, representing the 100% chance that something happens, either they answer the question correctly or they answer the 
question incorrectly. Now, if we say we're talking about the first question, there's a 17% chance that we know the answer to the first question, which is a small part of this square. Let's say we use green to represent the probability that we answer a question correctly. We know there's a 17% chance that we know the answer to the first question, and so we can represent that with this strip that's around a sixth of the total probability, because 17% is close to a sixth. Now, the thing is, the rest of this area, the rest of the probability, is not completely us getting the question wrong, because it's true or false. So even if we don't know the answer, well, if we don't know the answer, we could still get it right. And we may reasonably assume there is a 50-50 chance we get it right if it's a true or false question. Of course, that's just another in a long line of assumptions in dealing with this problem, but hey, it's fairly reasonable. So if this was 17%, then all of this area where we don't know the answer to the question would be the remaining 83%. And then half of that 83% would be 41.5%. So this is 41.5% and we can shade that. In this situation too, we get the question right. We don't know the answer, but we luck out and correct the, and select, excuse me, the correct thing, whether it be true or false. That leaves another 41.5% down here where we unfortunately select the incorrect answer be it true or false. We would thus find, adding up the green area, that for the first question, there's a 58.5% chance we get it correct. Now, of course, 58.5% might seem like a pretty high number, given that there was only a 17% chance we would even know the answer to the question, but it seems hard to imagine that this problem would specify the questions are true or false unless we were supposed to assume that even if we don't know the answer, we still have a 50% chance of getting it right because it's true or false. Why else would we be given that information? Now we can go through the rest of these computations from the student's perspective of how to solve this problem uh, without drawing the pictures. So from the picture that we just did, we saw there was a 0.58 five probability that we get the first question correct. And then we would go through this same logic for question two. Question two says that we have what? A 59% chance of knowing the answer. So we would say, okay, there's a 0.59 probability that we know the answer to the second question. And then for the remaining 41% chance that we don't know the answer, half of that probability we'd be getting it correct just by luck because it's true or false. So we could just write plus one half multiplied by 0.41. So even if we don't know the answer, there's still half of that time where we would get it right just by luck. We're multiplying these two probabilities together because we are still assuming that the likelihood of answering a question correctly is uh, all independent. And so now we just have to multiply by the probability that we get the third question correct said there was a 70% chance, 70%, that we know the answer to that question. And so we would have 0.7 and then plus half of the remaining 30%, which is 0.15. Because again, even in that 30% case where we don't know the answer, half of the time, as in 15%, we would just get it right by luck. Now doing all this math, this comes out to about 40% or a 0.4 probability that we answer all three questions correctly, which is certainly a more optimistic calculation than the professor's proposed solution, which gave us a seven, meager 7% 7 chance of getting all three questions correct. Now, in each of these probability calculations, we're actually using something called the law of total probability, which is a beautiful and pretty intuitive law telling us roughly that to calculate the probability of an event, we can add up the probabilities of the different ways that the event could happen. Like here, there's a 17% chance we get the question correct because we know the answer, but then there's also a 41.5% chance that we get the question correct 
in the case that we don't know the answer, because we still might get it right just by luck. So which solution do you think is better? There's certainly a lot we could say about this problem. Many people on the original Reddit thread had conflicting opinions or just really thought it was a terrible question. I mean, the thought of having a 17% chance of knowing a true or false question, it just feels a little strange. It almost feels like an AI written question. You could think a minute to try to make sense of that 17%, like the true and false questions are based on some material, and maybe the first question was chosen to represent some material that was only gone over briefly, so it's pretty unlikely that you would know the answer to that first question. But regardless, the probabilities here, the whole wording of the question, everything's just a little weird. In my opinion, the student's um actually solution is far better than the professor's. It's totally bizarre that the question would mention that the problems on the test are true and false questions unless you were supposed to solve it the way that the student did. There's no reason to mention their true or false questions unless you're supposed to take that into consideration. Uh, the professor's solution would be just as valid if we ignored that detail that the questions are true or false. It's just, oh, 17% chance we get the first one right, 59% chance we get the second one right, and so on. And that would be a reasonable way to read the problem, perhaps, if it didn't say specifically they're true or false. So even if you don't know the information, there's still a great chance you get the question right. But let me know in the comments what you think, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. I get a kick out of these slightly ambiguous problems that can be considered a couple different ways. They're far more interesting than the ugly PEMDAS problems that you might have seen going viral. Anyhow, that's it for me. Be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. Breaking in my past, I'm making it up fast So slow down, give me the time so I can fake it Erase the tune of words and just how I say shit and let me speak my poetry to your face It's not in the mid if you ain't listening Not infinite if you ain't really in the